So if you look at this diagram here, I've got a neuron. So there's the cell body, some dendrites that are branching off of it. Here's the axon of that neuron. And what this diagram is also trying to represent are other axons from other neurons that are connected, that are hooked up to, at least chemically, this first neuron. So here is an axon from another neuron. Notice it comes down, forms these terminal branches. We have these little synaptic knobs out here. And it looks like these synaptic knobs are in direct contact with this first neuron I talked about. However, if we take one of these areas between a synaptic knob and a dendrite and we magnify it more highly, what you'll see is there's actually a space between the synaptic knob, which you can see here, and the body of the neuron itself. So there's a teeny tiny little gap right here. So we've spent quite a bit of time talking about the axon, the structure of neurons, and the fact that action potentials move down neurons away from the cell body. What we're gonna get into today is what happens when that action potential gets to the very end of the axon, when it gets to the synapse or the synaptic knob, and then needs to cross the synapse to cause the neuron that it's hooked up to to actually generate an action potential or an electrical signal. So this is a process which is known as synaptic transmission. And we're going to get you familiar with that today because we're going to be looking at synaptic transmission in the brain and what's happening to actually allow neurons to communicate with each other in the brain. So here's what happens when we get this movement of the signal from the synaptic knob of one axon to the cell body or the dendrites of another neuron. We get a nerve impulse, it's gonna travel down the axon to the synaptic knob. And on that synaptic knob, we have calcium channels and we have sodium channels. And when the action potential or the electrical signal gets to that synaptic knob, we're gonna have calcium and sodium channels that actually open up on that structure. So here we've got the synaptic knob a little bit more highly magnified especially if you look at this picture down here, the synaptic knob is what contains the neurotransmitter. So you can see represented these little blue dots, a neurotransmitter that's been stored in the synaptic knob. Once we get that action potential all the way down to the synaptic knob, we have calcium channels and also sodium channels that open on the synaptic knob. And calcium's at a higher concentration outside of the cell, outside of the synaptic knob. So when calcium channels open on the synaptic knob, as this diagram is showing, we get calcium that moves into the synaptic knob. Once that calcium is inside the synaptic knob, it reacts with what are known as snare proteins, which cause these little vesicles, so these little structures that are containing the neurotransmitter, to actually fuse with the cell membrane or the plasma membrane of the synaptic knob and release that neurotransmitter by exocytosis. So that neurotransmitter then is going to travel across the synapse. You can see that happening represented by these little blue dots. And once it gets to the end of the synapse or once it crosses that space that makes up the synapse, then it's going to bind to the cell membrane or the plasma membrane of our second neuron in the pathway for basically changing the chemical environment of this second neuron that causes it to be stimulated. It causes sodium channels to open on the dendrites and or the soma of the second neuron. And that's how we're gonna communicate this electrical signal from the first neuron to the second neuron. So that's a process which is known as synaptic transmission. And synaptic transmission is completed through the use of neurotransmitters. So again, these are just chemicals that are stored in the synaptic knob. Once we have an action potential that makes its way to that synaptic knob, those neurotransmitters are released. They move across the synapse or that gap between the synaptic knob and the next neuron and bind to the next neuron in the pathway to cause a reaction in that neuron to potentially cause it to generate its own electrical signal or action potential. Now, a few things that you should know about neurotransmitters. When neurotransmitters are released to stimulate a muscle cell or a gland, 
or an organ or even another neuron. As long as those neurotransmitters are in the synaptic cleft, they're going to be stimulating that second neuron. And that's not usually something that we want to happen. We want neurotransmitters to be released. We want them to bind. We want them to cause their stimulating effect to get that signal across, to get that message sent. And then we want the neurotransmitters cleared out of there so that they don't continue to stimulate the muscle or the gland or the next neuron in the pathway or whatever it is indefinitely. So there's a couple of ways that the body can go about doing this to ensure that neurotransmitters stimulate the neuron, the next neuron in the pathway or the muscle cell or whatever it is without overstimulating it, chronically stimulating it, stimulating it for the long term. So the first of these processes that we can use to get neurotransmitters out of the synaptic knob so that they're not stimulating the postsynaptic neuron indefinitely is through what's known as reuptake. And this diagram over here is actually showing you the process of reuptake. So we have a synaptic knob. This synaptic knob had neurotransmitter that was stored in it. Neurotransmitter was released. It crossed the synaptic cleft. It bound to this postsynaptic neuron caused its stimulating effect, and now once it's done that, it's done what we've needed it to do, you actually see the neurotransmitter being taken back up through endocytosis into the synaptic knob where it's gonna be stored until it's needed again. So that's a process which is known as reuptake, and we see a lot of the neurotransmitters in the body being cleared from the synaptic class so that they're not permanently um, activating our postsynaptic neuron through this particular process. Another way that we'll sometimes see neurotransmitters being cleared from the synaptic cleft so that they're not constantly, chronically, permanently stimulating that postsynaptic neuron is through degradation by enzymes. So when we were talking about skeletal muscle contraction, you guys learned about acetylcholine and learned that that is the neurotransmitter that's used in skeletal muscle contraction. And when it's released from a neuron, it crosses the neuromuscular junction, that synaptic cleft between the synaptic knob of a neuron and the skeletal muscle cell, and it binds to the skeletal muscle cell and it initiates that signal that tells the skeletal muscle to contract. But we have to be able to get acetylcholine out of the synaptic cleft. Otherwise, we would permanently stimulate the muscle and it would never relax. So in this case, with that particular neurotransmitter, we use an enzyme to actually break down the acetylcholine and destroy it. So it isn't taken back up into the synaptic knob and, and stored for later use. Rather, we use an enzyme which is known as acetylcholinesterase to actually break down that acetylcholine and clear it from the synapse, from the synaptic cleft so that we don't have it there permanently stimulating the muscle and the muscle can go back to a relaxed state when we no longer need it to be contracting. So here's just another slide that looks at neurotransmitters a little bit, um, just to give you some idea of the variability that we see in neurotransmitters in the body. There are at least 50 different chemicals in the body that act as neurotransmitters, and we're discovering new ones all the time. So I've just got a list here of some examples. Acetylcholine is one that we've talked about already. That is the neurotransmitter that's used in skeletal muscle contraction. But we also have all different kinds of classes of chemicals um, that are actually acting in some circumstances as neurotransmitters in the body. So we've got some what are known as biogenic amines, which are really just kind of modified amino acids. Um, we're going to look specifically in the activity that you do in this folder at dopamine and also um, at a biogenic amine, which is known as serotonin, that act as neurotransmitters in the body. There are actually some gases that act as neurotransmitters in the body. Peptides are chains of amino acids, so there's some chemicals that are peptides, that's their chemical classification that act as neurotransmitters. And then we also see some amino acids that are acting as neurotransmitters in the body as well. So there's a great variability as far as different kinds of chemicals that are capable of acting as neurotransmitters and that are used as neurotransmitters in certain circumstances within our bodies.